We're here to talk about how you can thrive in the age of Amazon. We've got Scott, Ka Scott Oshman with the Cairn Company from the Seattle area, Pacific Northwest. We have Mark Sherman from the Outdoor Gear Exchange in Vermont. Colin Moynihan from Uncle Dan's, part of Camping World Now. If you want to hear stories about Marcus Limonis, talk to Colin. And Jay Getzel from Mountain Smith. Chicago, yep, sorry. And Jay's from uh, here in Colorado. So I'm going to have Scott briefly walk us through five tactics that you can use to thrive in the age of Amazon. Scott runs a sales agency up in the Pacific Northwest, does a lot of work with Amazon, and helps a lot of small retailers and other businesses in their Amazon business. So I will turn it over to Scott. Okay, thank you very much. Rick says, and Rick uh, kind of was the brainchild of all of this, so big credit to him. So real quickly, and we're going to go through these one by one and get these gentlemen's uh, viewpoints. The paradigm shift talks about it. You know, it's basically the consumer now is driving, controlling a lot of the decisions. Path to purchase, where are they? You got to be, how do you catch them in that path to purchase? How do you catch the, the ever-changing consumer? 50-50 rule is basically some form or shape of your store, your business has to be digital in some way. If it isn't now, it, it should be or probably will be. No friction or frictionless experience, excuse me. That's from the consumer side. As a specialty retailer, as all of our businesses, how do you make it so it is absolutely frictionless, easy experience? And then the last thing is basically how do you know being a VIP. How do we put in those mechanics for our consumers so that they feel special coming to our stores, buying from us? Uh, again and again, and you see that all kinds of loyalty programs and such. And we're not going to spend too much time talking on the paradigm shift because I think that's been all over the news. We all know that consumers are doing everything online, they're doing everything on their phone, and they're driving the bus, so to speak, right? They're calling the shots. So we're going to, we've all acknowledged that. We're going to go right to the path to purchase and get some feedback on these guys on how they may have shifted their path to purchase. It used to be that the guy just walked in the door and shopped your store and bought stuff, but now they're coming to you in bunches of different ways. What have you guys done to shift that path to purchase? Mark, you want to start us out on that? Well, in the last year, we've really invested in our events and are trying to drive more of a community and not just a shop. So at this point, we have an event almost every week, sometimes twice a week. We work with our vendors. We work with local nonprofits, and we really try to tie it together. Sorry. Um, to summarize the first part, we're doing more events this year. We do uh, at least one a week, and uh, we're really trying to connect our vendors with our customers, with the nonprofits in the area that we support, and uh, we really go out of our way to make sure that our customers know what we're doing is more than just selling gear. We're, we're promoting experiences, we're trying to build a healthier lifestyle, but we're also trying to connect them with our, with our staff and with the uh, various organizations in the area that we feel are important to try to create more engagement. So they're not just coming to us for the piece of gear or the uh, piece of equipment or clothing that they can buy online, but also for the experience of talking to our staff, learning where our staff are playing in the outdoors, which in Vermont usually means, yeah, I can't tell you. But otherwise, you know, what are our favorite, favorite parks? How can we engage? And um, we're also, we try to involve ourselves with the local governments and where, where can we get more people outside and work with uh, public-private um, collaborations to just get more people outside. If we can get more people outside, it doesn't matter in what way, they are going to at some point become our customers. And just as, a, as an example, um, Sierra Trading Post moved into Burlington uh, about two years ago, right at the beginning of the winter that wasn't. So we have no idea how they've impacted our business. But when they were coming to town, a lot of people were asking, were we concerned about it? And the answer was no, because even if a customer goes to them before they come to us, at some point, a, a, good, a good customer is going to learn more and more. It's going to learn more and more about what they want to do outside, and eventually they're going to become an Outdoor Gear Exchange customer in Burlington. So if whoever gets more people outside, that benefits us in the long run, and so we support that in any way we can. Colin, how do you guys shift the path to purchase? Sure. Uh, as a, I mean, we're primarily a brick-and-mortar business in Chicago. Uh, we have five stores that are named Uncle Dan's. We will have four more that are named Air One Outfitters uh, as of this week. And so there's complexity to the, the distribution there. And uh, a few of the things we've tried to do as we realize that everyone's starting their path to purchase online now um, is to, to try to be there for the customer in, in 
every single possible way that we can where five years ago we recognized growing a website was important for sales, but, but also more so it's important to draw the connection to your stores. And so in the last year especially, we've really started to promote our website in our store and promote functionality we were working on for a couple of years that we all hear about now and the big guys do it. Um, but just being able to offer buy online, pick up in store, um, and, and try to remind our loyal customer that we can be their spot to start their path to purchase uh, as, as well as anybody else. And so we hope that the continual reminders will, will make them think of us and, and the brick and mortar uh, and specialty component to our business. So that I think has been successful and it's driven our web business to where uh, the majority of Illinois is our largest state on our web and it's not the largest population state in the country and I think uh, we're seeing things that suggest that this focus on web can actually really benefit us locally. Great. Uh, the other part is Amazon since that's what this uh, is a little bit about and so while we are still a brick and mortar business uh, I think we recognized a couple years ago that if our customers shifting then we have to shift too. It might not be where we're gonna say that that's our strength, but we need to be competent on that channel. We need to do everything we can to show our brands that we're competent, they can trust us, they can trust that we'll keep price. Um, because the reality is that any customer coming into our store is probably an Amazon shopper too. And, and so we're, we're trying really hard to talk to brands about that and about how it's important for brands to to support specialty and it's really tough right now because pricing is critical and restricting the amount of retailers that you allow to sell on Amazon is very clearly a way to help police and protect price but at the same time and we talked about this on your podcast a little bit um, I think f it, it's kind of on the industry and the ecosystem to, to start to think a little bit beyond the pricing component and figure out ways to protect price but also allow all these specialty smaller guys that are trying to gain skill in that market to, to take part. And I think we're all, we have a long way to go in this industry to get there. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what will help keep specialty vibrant. I really do. Without that, I think it's important to special. keep specialty vibrant. Yeah. yeah. Great. And Jay, how, do you, how does Mountain Smith support these retailers in finding the consumer um, in that path to purchase? Well, our, our Mountain Smith business isn't really focused on our own direct-to-consumer business. We are less than 3% of our sales um, direct-to-consumer on our website. So certainly our digital marketing spend um, is intended to drive traffic, drive awareness, consciousness of the brand, and then ultimately customers to our retail stores. Cool. Great. That's excellent. And so the next tactic is the 50-50 rule. And I think you know, at some point, part of your business needs to be digital and that's continuing to grow. And so what part of your business is digital? Maybe not 50%, but and it doesn't have to be sales, could be social media. Mark, or Colin, you want to start with that one? Also internal, guys? internally, as far as operations, any type of thing like that. Sure, uh, I mean, the first one that comes to mind probably for a lot of us in, in the business is marketing. I mean, if, if you're growing a web business, uh, you have to spend money through Google or, or whatever means to help drive traffic, organic is the goal obviously, but paid traffic is, is important to success. And so that's become by far our largest marketing uh, expense. Uh, and then social on the local level has kind of begun to take over that, that piece of the local marketing pie too, where you can better target. And I mean, we have a, lot, a, a ways to go, probably to get as sophisticated as we can to really reach the right customer but it's a much easier path than you know, a blanket mailer or those kind of traditional marketing tools, which we still use, but that's, if you're trying to direct to the, to the right customer, I think we can get more sophisticated digitally. And then the other piece for us that uh, has helped is we made the decision a few years ago to switch our business platform to a cloud-based platform so that we internally could run our business from anywhere. Having multiple stores, uh, working remotely, traveling. I mean, we, we pro I think a lot of people probably have this reality still with a server-based world where you have to remote in to get access to your folders. And I mean, it, it honestly it changed everything for us. So that, I, th I think that's digital because it's all yeah. driven oh, through yeah. a website. Yeah. 
Um, and it's also allowed us to, you know, bring our point of sales outside for events or bring them anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so that's been that's been huge and all driven through this digital revolution, I guess. Yeah. Excellent. Mark, how about you? What part of your business is digital? It, it's got to be well over 50%. Um, at the top line, it's about 40%. So we've got uh, multiple channels within that. So we're on gearx.com, which is our website. Um, that drives a lot of business into the store as well. So even though that might not be as much top line or a reality as it is top line, just like um, Colin said, people are engaging online first. Our number one state of visit is Vermont. And we know that that's not our number one state of shipping. So our customers are choosing to visit online first. Um, but we also are engaged on Amazon, both with Fulfilled by Merchant and FBA. And that's allowing us to sort of engage in a lot of different places. And sure, we want you to buy local when you're in Burlington, but we want you to buy from us when you're somewhere else. So the buy local thing is great for when you're in, in state, but you still have to send that message of who you are wherever you're, you're marketing to. And yeah, we, do, we use digital in-house for communication, and that's actually a challenge. We've got to give our staff a certain amount of time every week to read emails, honestly, because the communication with about 120 staff, even though we're all in one building, is incredibly robust. Uh, the number of emails we get while we're just not there makes it so on the way home, you know, my partner and I, after a trip like this, will actually spend a week, or I mean a day, just at home for every week we're away, reading emails that came in and trying to respond. And Jay, are you guys supporting folks in this digital uh, initiative? We, de we definitely are. I think uh, over the course of the last couple of years and with a greater focus in 2018 on working directly with some of our dealers on digital marketing initiatives together, um, certainly one we did with Mark and Outdoor Gear Exchange last year has been the way that we found we can tap into the connectivity between the local market and our retail stores and grow the consciousness of the Mountain Smith brand with the captive audience that they already have, um, you know, coming to their site to shop, coming to their community to look for outdoor gear. So it's a, a great place for us to interact with our retailers. And budgetary wise for 2018, the emphasis is growing on that and being ratcheted back off of you know, print media and other you know, things that we used to do um, and being more focused on retail marketing and consumer direct marketing digitally. That's awesome. And Scott, on these first two tactics, path to purchase and 50-50 rule, have we missed anything or anything that you I got are nothing. working with? I got, got nothing, nothing, Rick. You know Thanks, me. I got Scott. nothing. Thanks for the help. No. <laughs> path to purchase is, if you have, like me, I have teenage kids, just if, if it's not in your bubble of life to understand where people are looking for things, be cognizant of all the different things that, I, I don't use Snapchat. My daughter said that that's probably a good idea. But you have to be aware of these things. So if you're not subscribing or, you know, everybody has too many newsletters and all this stuff, but, you know, check out something out of your comfort zone to see what the newest technologies and the adaption rates are so that you are there before and you're positioned to win before all of a sudden it's a saturated channel. That's good. That's great. And um, so the next one is frictionless experience. Mark, let's start with you. What are you doing to create a frictionless experience for your consumer? <laughs> well, uh, right. lots of lube. Um, so from, uh, from the early days, our goal has always been to be easy to do business with. And, you know, every one of us has a lot of vendors, a lot of sales reps that Get they can here. work with. Uh, every on, every one of our... On I'm not a rock star like you. They want to hear you. It. So every one of our vendors can do business with a lot of different retailers. Every one of our reps can do business with a lot of different retailers. And our goal is to be the easiest one to do business with. So if, if what we're looking for is um, digital orders, then that's what we want to submit. If people prefer analog orders, then that's what we want to submit. We want to try to do our best to pay on time, to communicate when we can't, and just make sure that the relationship is one that people are excited to be in. Um, it's all about passion. Our customers should come to us first because we're fun to deal with. We make it easy. A great example is we have a common sense return policy. Bring it back, you can return it. We're going to work with you to make that work when it's not convenient for us, but ultimately, if it's good for you, it's good for us. So we're going to make changes when we have to and make it so that you don't feel that once it leaves the store, we never want to see it again. We want you to come back for whatever reason that's good for us. Colin, how about you guys? How are you creating a frictionless path? Sure, I'll break it down, I guess, into the customer side and then the internal side. Um, on the customer side, touched on, you know, buy online, pick up in store, just try to make it easy for our customers to start their experience with us. Um, 
And, but, but then we've also started to look at things in the other direction where we want to be able to service our in-store customer because if we don't have what they need when they come in, they can buy it per perhaps online. If we That's don't huge, that by the way. That is a big, is that not a big deal for everybody? I mean, that is critical and not hard, not easy to do. Sorry, I had to interrupt. It was going to happen. Uh, anytime. Uh, and, and so that's where we've, we've started to say, OK, we have multiple doors. Um, we have, it, it, it's nice in the sense that we often will have you know, product in our other stores that we might not have if it's a hot product. Um, and so one of the things that we did uh, was, was simply to get a van. I mean, we used to use a service to, to ship product Old from school. our central uh, DC, and we would pay money, and it wasn't flexible. Uh, but now with our own internal driver and van, we can promise a customer that if we don't have the product, they have two options. The first is that we can have it for them tomorrow by noon, or we'll phone, give them a phone call. Uh, or we can ship the product straight to their house for tomorrow in Chicago. Uh, if we have to ship further, it might cost something. But, but we just want to give them the opportunity to get the product they're looking for as quickly as possible, even if it's not in the particular store that they're in. So that's been, that's been fun to practice and learn on. Fun and to implement. To tie into that, um, we just started this. And we stole the idea from a snowboard shop that we saw in Chicago. But we put touchscreen monitors in our stores. And essentially, it's just a giant touchscreen computer where we have our website. And so it, to me, it just it connects those two worlds. And yeah, it, that's great. It makes it a little more seamless. And yeah. so staff can use these touch screens to actually pull up product they're talking about and use it for an educational purpose. Uh, or a customer can actually use it to look at a particular product they might not find, and they're, they're able to see which other stores it's in. And it's just fun, too. It, yeah, it that's draws awesome. the eye. Yeah, cool. And Jay, you guys are doing some unique things to help these guys get product faster and create frictionless purchases. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we talk quite a bit internally. We had a, a phone call to prepare for this, uh, for this event a couple weeks ago and chatted really about our people um, is where I think that we come into play there. Um, you know, Mark mentioned that for, as a retail buyer, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. There's a lot of, you know, product overlap within our space. There's a ton of product out there. And really, it's about developing the relationships with our retailers that allow us to have a seamless experience for them. Because the better we are at delivering product to our retail store, the easier it's going to be for them to ultimately, you know, pass it along to the consumer. So it's really about our people. I mean, Mountain Smith is a 40-year-old brand, but there's seven of us in our office. We're a tiny, tiny little team. You could just as easily call for a zipper repair and talk to me on the phone as you could our customer service person. Um, and it's a fun vibe that, you know, interchangeably amongst a president or a marketing manager or a customer service guy, um, you're going to get a very seamless, very frictionless experience when you talk to us. So hopefully that then, you know, perpetuates out to our retailers and the consumer. Yeah, that, that's excellent. I had one more yeah. Yeah, to add in on sorry. the No, the no, no, that's not allowed. No, I'm kidding. Okay, sorry. I'm no, go ahead, Colin. Um, so on the internal side, this goes back to the technology investment. Uh, and I know it's such a big investment for specialty businesses that it's easy to keep pushing it off. Uh, I think the reality, if you sit down and look at the savings that you can get from efficiencies, uh, more than proved out for us that it was an important investment. But what it's done is it's made things like web fulfillment that much easier for our stores. So an order can come in. Yeah on our website, and for us, we don't have a giant warehouse where all our web product is, it's in our stores. And it's a, we're trying to diversify the opportunities to sell it. And so now, the web order can come in, and we've got systems in place that can identify the right store to ship the product, can set up a template that's really clear for our staff. And I mean, it's probably shaved, it probably takes 20% of the time it used to, to fulfill a web order. Uh, which is huge in, so in our know, world yeah. and for and labor. And how long and ago did you make that shift? It was uh, two years. Okay. Fall of uh, fall of 2016. Yeah, and so you start two years in. It's right away. Yeah. It was I mean, relative. It was not. Two years in it was a painful experience going through <laughs> the shift. Yeah. Uh, but very very necessary, I think, yeah. if you want to evolve and and be able to keep up. Yeah. Really. And Scott, and, you got. And actually, we've had the same experience. We we've evolved into making sure that we know where every product is in the store. And even though it's one building, we've got multiple warehouses, multiple rack systems. Yeah. And we're picking, often for our fulfillment online, we're picking out of the racks on the store. So where we don't have enough to have back stock, 
our web fulfillers have to go up onto the sales floor. They need to be able to interact with customers when they do. But we also have to know where that is on the floor for people who don't work the floor every day. Right. So we've got every, lay, every rack has a number and a location. Uh, makes it easy for our web wow. customers to get fulfilled quickly. But it also makes sure that the product's always where it's supposed to be. Yeah. And, and we are about to invest in a system as well. And that's, that's going to make a big difference. We've already been working with one system for 16 years. We've evolved it over time through uh, hacking into it and learning how to do read right into the database and do our own add-ons. But in the end, going up with the next system is going to be a huge difference. And one we weren't ready to make five or six or even three years ago when we started looking into these. And, and now we really need to with the way our business has grown. And especially with the omni-channel approach where we're dealing with customers on multiple different places, in-store, online, shopping, online, yep. viewing, and on Amazon in two different places. And that maximizes your inventory. It's not yep. sitting around waiting. Yeah. And have uh, we missed anything, Scott? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, how many retailers do we have out in, in the audience today? Raise your hand if you're a retailer. Fantastic. Not want to exclude anybody else. But here's the other thing. If, all, if you don't have all of this stuff and you want to just dabble and dip your toe, the beautiful thing is, and I'm not an advocate for one or the other, everybody has experiences, but if you're just trying to piece it all together and have an online e-commerce and have in-store and understand off one inventory system, and if you're trying to build out those multiple sales channels, guess what? For $39.95 a month, Shopify, there's a lot of shopping carts that you can tie in now way easier depending on your POS, disclaimer there, so if you're just daunting, it's daunting. I can't figure it out. I'm a small person. I don't, you're a small store. Believe me, there's no other time than now that you can actually make that happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, how do we take, and we've talked about this a little bit, how do you protect yourself in the store from the phone? How do you make it so I talk about having a, a, you know, a repricer tool right actually on the shelf? So there's a lot of things in digital or electronic labeling coming through that's tied into your inventory and all these things. How do we make it so we utilize, if everybody's going to Amazon to look and they're using part of their research and they want to look how many stars and how many reviews, how do you ride that wave and make sure when in the store, you're not shying away from that. You're going to let that help you because you have those products. Why not sell it while they're there? How are you guys doing that? I kind of stole that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Rick. That's good. No, that's good. Um, and the last one is VIP. So it's kind of a gaming mechanics concept. We want to make everybody feel like a VIP. So what, do you, what are some of the things you guys are doing to make your customers feel like VIPs? Colin? I, I think to start, I would say we have, we have a ways to go. I, I think REI sets the bar in our, in our eyes. Um, we can't offer 10% off necessarily. We don't have a large assortment of in-house product that's going to enhance margins to make that really possible. Um, and so it's always this internal question like, do we try to keep up or do we try to offer our own customized version of this? And so at Uncle Dan's, we've come up with our own customized version, but you know, it comes with a, a slightly lower discount. Um, and, and, and so I'm just, I know we have a ways to go. Uh, as we roll a partner business, Erwan, into our business, they've adopted a model that's closer to REI. Yeah. And so we have to figure out what's, what's the right model there or what's our model as we, our new world is tied yeah. in with yeah. Camping World now and right. they have a pretty broad rewards program. So how do we offer other incentives right. like discounts at the local climbing gyms or ski right. passes right. Or, or other things that tie to the outdoor experience in the local area? Yeah. Uh, but I know we have we have a lot to think about gotcha. in that regard. Yeah. yeah, Mark, you guys are making people feel Simi special. Similar to what uh, Colin was saying, we we do have a long way to go, and and all the research we've done over the years about a loyalty program is you really need to be best in class, and like you said, REI is. So we're looking at different angles as a concept of being able to give our customers maybe advanced advanced sale deals, a first opportunity on new product. You know, we're 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 here at the show looking at product and making sure that we've got advanced video and photography of things that are coming in so that they can see it with us first. Uh, we do whatever we can. When, when my partner and I are working on the sales floor, 
I have a, a, a lucky gift for names. I know most of my customers that have been in around for a lot for names. <laughs> That's and I'll, great. I'll just say, hi, what are you up to? I know what their kids were doing. Some of their kids work for us. They were toddlers when they first started shopping in the store sure. yeah. 20 years ago. And so making that connection, a one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, one thing that we did recently, and we're going to try to engage in again, we bought our building three years ago, and we did a um, self-designed crowdfunding program. So we picked you know, all of our customers, we gave them this opportunity, and about 200 of them invested. Some just gave us money to help buy the building, small amounts. Others gave investments, which we returned with uh, additional in-store credit over the course of three years. And what that gave us was a guaranteed touch point with every one of those customers every yeah. three months when we gave them back awesome. some money. And now we've got a big thank you uh, plaque up on the wall for all that they did for us. And uh, we're now looking at um, a way to engage with our in-store customers through follow-up emails and online um, transactional messages. So for our online customers, you buy something, you get a note saying we're shipping it, we get a note saying can you tell us how it worked, did you get it on time? We're not doing that with our in-store customers and that's something we're trying to uh, develop, mm -hmm. is a way to let people know, yeah, we know you just spent a bunch of money on a set of skis and boots, we want to thank you for it, we want to give you an opportunity to give us some feedback on the experience and we want to learn what we can do better the next time. And, and trying to engage with the in-store customer on the digital media is another way that we can transfer their attention to us online and not just when they're walking down the street. That's awesome. That's great. And Jay, you guys doing anything to help these guys make customers feel special? Um, I mean, from a VIP experience, not direct to consumer wise, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the number one thing that we stand behind is our Forge for Life warranty. Yep. Um, you know, having a rock solid warranty policy as a brand, kind of like Mark had mentioned with his common sense approach to the return policy, we just need to 100% of the time take care of our customers. That way, our buyers have faith in assorting our products, That's their great. retail staff has faith in selling our products, and we know that we're not going to leave somebody you know, out there in the field trying to enjoy an experience with an you know, inferior product. Yeah, that's, that's a big one right you there. Know, yeah. I would, to add to that, so many vendors like Mountain Smith offer guarantees like that. And, and what we really do is emphasize that in the store. So if something has a guarantee like that, whether it's a you know, lifetime guarantee, a forged for life guarantee, whatever you want to call it, we make sure that's called out on the signs and the tags that are on the product so our customer knows that. The same goes for price matching. You know, we talked about this on the phone when we were chatting two weeks ago. We really want our customer, you know, we don't want to do dynamic pricing. We don't want our customer to come in on a Tuesday, buy something, and find out on a Wednesday that we've lowered it because we saw it somewhere else cheaper. We want them to know they're getting the best price when they're in, but we also advertise that if they find it in the next few days for a lower price, come back in. We'll match it. We, we want you, to, we want you to, to, um, to make that purchase when you're in the store and not have to go home and find out. That's really important. That's important, yeah. Scott, we missed anything? Well, the one thing I put up there is the Starbucks. How many people have the Starbucks app on their phone? How many people use it? Not that many. Wow, I thought there'd be more. So learning that. lessons, that is one of the most popular used payment system in all of retail. And the tease is, is because, first of all, it's frictionless. You don't have to worry about it. It's all the, the mobile payment. But they're constantly saying, hey, two more stars, and you get you know, a free $4 mocha. So it's, it's back to that engaging, making them feel like they're VIP when they come in the store. If they bought online, you caught them. Hey, guess what? You're part of a very special club, which is the other huge trend, which is personalization and customization to make everybody feel like they're special at your stores and your brands. And so that's internal as well for staff, employees, everything else. So yeah, yeah. that's the one thing about uh, the VIP. It's the gaming mechanic. It's why we all sit there on our phones and I go on planes and see everybody playing Candy Crush or whatever it is, words with friends. They don't win anything, there's no money, <laughs> but it's a human psychology, we're competitive. And I want the Marriott points, yeah, okay? exactly, right. Um, <laughs> so before we open up to, to audience questions here, you guys have anything, final thoughts you wanna add or? You got it all out? Well, Similar to what you said, you got to, you've got to be thinking ahead. Everybody, yeah. you've, you know, we, we're always looking who, who might be coming into the market? What's happening? What's the weather event coming up? How do we connect to that? We, we need to know what's happening next before it happens. And sometimes you make, it, make a mistake and you guess wrong, but more often than not, you know, we're all in business because we like what we're doing. We're paying attention to the clues, and it's our job to get ahead of everything so that our customer doesn't have to feel like we're behind. 
Uh, and then I think I just touched on the the brick and mortar concept in general, uh, and just say f for us, I think we're still all in on this brick and mortar concept. But the only way I think we can be all in on it is if we connect these other pieces of the puzzle that relate to digital or websites. Uh, and, and the example lately that's been resonating for me is my wife using Instacart for groceries. She just learned about this, and it's changed our world. But that, and Amazon buying Whole Foods. Yeah. I, I think the brick and mortar b business, in our mind, it's not going anywhere. But, but sales aren't just going to go increase on their own. Right, right. The only way that it's actually going to keep growing is this digital component of tying it all together. Bit, yeah. Yeah. Jay? I mean, our stores are our conduit to our customers because of our you know, lack of emphasis on direct-to-consumer sales. So our support of our retail stores and the work that our staff does to make that a, you know, experience that's easy for them, you know, I think is what we're going to continue to do heading into 2018 and beyond. Um, and I think you know, making sure that as the consumer consciousness of our band, brand grows and our retail relationships, you know, it's just important that we you know, work together to make sure that there is a higher perceived value, you know, the, the race to the bottom that we're all trying to avoid right. um, this, this, this addiction to promotion. Right. Um, it's more about the experiences. It's more about the, you know, the philanthropic things that we're doing together. It's about the partnerships we have with our retail stores and what our consumers are doing when they go outside. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Scott? No, I'll, I'm a, I'll go out and get questions. How about that? I, I, I oh, want to throw one more thing out there, too. Oh, okay, a sorry. lot of you guys are, you know, some of this is very daunting. You know, some of this software is very expensive. Some of these tactics are things that we might have to learn that we've never used before. And I just encourage you all to keep trying to do one new thing a month. And by the end of the year, you've got 12 new things. You've got a whole new business. And don't give up. I mean, we all had to learn how to walk someday. And when we were babies, we kept getting up and falling down, getting up and falling down. It's a good thing our mom didn't look at us and say, oh, he's not a walker. And this let us crawl around the world, right? We kept trying and trying and trying and trying. So don't give up one piece at a time, and you'll get there. So. Let's open up the questions. I think we've got some microphones that we can pass around that you guys can. I there. can yeah. jump out, Sarah, if you want me to, because I'm loud. Let's talk some numbers. Budget percentage. Uh, say budget. that again. Can you repeat the question? No. Budget percentage. Budget percentage for what? Digital marketing. And also, you talked about infrastructure. So two things. Budget and marketing for, for you guys got that? Yeah, well, with, with uh, AdWords, it's, it's really a pay-to-play thing. So we try to make the money available to drive the sales. And if we're getting the clicks, we, we let the budget keep going up. In terms of uh, brick-and-mortar print media advertising, we kind of have to do it. We try to do it as smartly as possible. Um, and we know that it's hard to track what's actually working. Um, I think when you look at um, stats on online marketing, the concept of a view through sale still does not resonate with me as a valid click. So, you know, yes, you might have seen an ad presented to you last week and you're buying this week. I can't tell you whether the ad you saw last week mattered, so I'm not counting that as part of my um, ROI, but it is, it's worth looking at. But, but yeah, the, the budget, it just needs to match what you're selling. Um, but you need to realize that that digital advertising is really also fueling your in-store business as well. System. What about systems? What about in all this huge investment in web-based? What about all the, the systems? What, what percentage? Is there anything to, to shed light on that, Colin or Mark? No comment? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how to put it into words other than uh, for us, systems actually ended up replacing IT costs. Uh, and so in a way, it, we, we had an out-service IT company that we paid the equivalent of probably two staff members every year and our system is probably the equivalent of one to one and a half staff of that, of yeah, one, yeah. you know, half of that with a tr tremendous amount of efficiencies built in. And then I would second what you said related to digital spend. Uh, when we first started growing our website, we set a pretty small monthly, we, we set an actual number, it, it might have been 500 bucks the first month. Uh, and we had a, a skilled person helping with our AdWords campaign. But ultimately, as we saw that prove out, we decided we were comfortable going a little higher until the point where you you realize or you're at, you have enough knowledge and, and confidence that as long as the spend aligns with the sales, and for I don't know I'll use a broad benchmark, but if we can keep it to 15 to 20 percent, um, it's not cheap, but 
you know, I, it's arguably like rent in a store. Uh, yeah. So, so as long as the that's two align and it's a percentage game, I think uh, that's our, our view. Yeah, that's good. Any other questions out there? Somebody's got to have something. Come, Come on, on now. Come on. Nothing. Scott, is there any wow. any tactics that we didn't talk about that you Whoa. you use with some of the the well, brands? I, I think it's. So automation, so think about what are the low level tasks that are important, they're extraordinarily important, but what can I automate that is a laborious, you know, very important, but it's formatting spreadsheets, it's cobbling together. How can I automate the parts of my business and my retail store where I can actually get the people that are, have great talent and knowledge and experience to spend more time? That's you know, Colin's example is one point. Do you have any other examples of that, Mark? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of uh, talk over the past several years about the challenges of the millennial um, workforce. But what comes with those challenges is a, is a digital native. And so what we found is that our staff is finding the solutions to those problems because they want to work more efficiently. If they're having trouble getting things barcoded, they're going to ask for better barcode readers. They're going to ask for different systems to generate those uh, those scans and want the communications to go between different systems. So we've got um, we we try to be pretty nimble with IT. We also do invest in systems, but we've got an in-house IT department that can address problems really quickly. We don't have to make a phone call to an outsourced agency or a software company. We've actually found that most of our software companies don't service their products as well as our in-house IT system and our staff can. And that allows us to address those really quickly and, um, and produce communication. But you know, people are learning new software um, programming. VBA in Excel allows us to create multiple interactions between the different systems in a way that works for each individual that has it. So that we've got our warehouse manager is also our efficiency manager. And he will go and work with anyone in the store who needs to try to create some efficiencies in their system. And being able to do that internally is huge because he already knows the problems and what the details are. So we don't have to educate an outsourced, um, you know, an outsourced contractor right. for every time we do it. That's great. And one of the things that Amazon uses a lot is ratings and reviews. Are you guys doing anything to allow your customers to rate and review products in your store or your store or anything like that? We have a ways to go on that front too. Uh, we're trying. I mean, we're not an Amazon, so our customer. If you have fifteen thousand SKUs on your website, uh, <laughs> it's hard to get reviews to all of those. Right. And so sometimes it's embarrassing to have a product up with the review stars and there's nothing there. Yeah. So we know we have to solve that problem. Uh, but we also want reviews of us as a business. So we use an, outs an outside company called Trustpilot right now. Okay. But after any web purchase or in-store purchase, uh, where we have the email, we send out like five days later, it's automated, gotcha. uh, a request for them to review the experience with Uncle Dan's. Mm -hmm. It's really eye-opening. I mean, if no, someone but. has a bad experience in the store and they share it with us, it's a great learning. It's an opportunity, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. To, to address that though, if you get a bad review, you need to respond to it immediately. Yeah. So if Free someone goes on community. Yelp and sees there's something negative, that there's some negative experience, you, you need to, you, you can apologize for it, you can explain it, you can try to justify it, but that communication has to be positive, it has to be acknowledging and, and that you wanna do better and that the person actually, their, their feelings are correct. Then you may not want, may not wanna have that be what people are reading, but they're gonna read it, you can't hide from it. That review is out there. Question. Yeah, I can get them. I can get them. Here, I'll get them. Hey. So I, I guess I wanted to ask a question about uh, more your UPC coding and your in house barcode coding um, for integration to website and whatnot. Are you using manufacturers' UPCs or are you generating your own in house? And we, so the question, real quick, was he wants to know how they're using UPC and barcoding actually and integrating that with your web online and all your other systems. Is that right? Did I ask that correct? Uh, we use the barcodes that come on the products for UPC, but we also have a SKU of our own that has its own barcode. But every product can scan either at the register, um, but we also have them linked to receiving logs and purchase orders so that all the, everything can scan automatically. So when our receivers get products, they just scan the barcodes onto the receiving log as they go, and it sorts them out and figures it out, and that's all part of the system.
Great. Colin? We migrated over to using vendor UPCs probably three or four years ago. It was around the same time that we went to Amazon, and it was a necessity. Uh, if anyone hasn't switched or doesn't have a field for records with vendor UPC, I would encourage you to do it because it's the only way you're really going to be able to play the digital game. Uh, and right now we're, we're experiencing with, with our new partner store, Erwan, that um, they never did use vendor UPCs. So we have to map 19,000 wow. SKU vendor UPCs and it's a major project, but it's worth the effort. Once, yeah. we, once we're done with it. Immediate payoff. And then we're speaking a universal language with everybody else, including Amazon. All right. So it makes it easier. Here's another one over there. And Jay, don't feel bad. I have one for you coming up. Yeah, I know. We got to get Jay in. Go ahead. So, what level of investment do you guys put in your in educating your retail employees on product knowledge and that sort of thing? Great question. Um, we have a pretty continuous stream of clinics through our through our vendors and our reps, and we have found though that, and oftentimes, other than new product that's coming out. Our retail specialists and our managers and our core users within the shop can give more relevant clinics than we can from people who are outside the business, and it makes use of the time more effectively. Uh, but and our but our our staff want to do this, and so we've actually created a system where by going to a certain number of clinics, whether they're with our vendors in house or off site, they can get um, essentially points towards raises that happen in between review cycles, so that. As people learn more and become more complete employees with their education level, we're paying them more. They don't have to wait for their annual review to get acknowledged. And they're very small incremental raises. To give someone who's making $26,000 a year a $75 raise for having attended an eight-hour on-snow clinic, the $75 may seem insignificant, but it's an acknowledgment that they've gone and they've learned more and that we value them more at that moment and not in eight months. That's great. We, we relied on in-store clinics, really, for a majority of product knowledge, along with 3.5 forever. Um, and it's great, and it's valuable to have a tech rep come in and, uh, and educate you. But at the same time, we, we've noticed over the time that we kind of it's like pulling teeth a little bit sometimes to get our staff to be excited to come in. Um, and so we're, we're still trying to figure out what's the answer to that. Beer. Beer is great, yeah, well, that always helps. Um, but we're thinking this year of, of doing, you mentioned on snow, on snow training, um, let's get everyone out for a camp out for the, I mean, we're kind of stealing this idea from other bigger guys that do this, but and that's okay. good, that's what we're talking about. Borrowing the idea, yeah. just borrowing it. Wa but, learning about a backpack sitting in the store is yeah, yeah. one thing, but wearing it and you know, getting out there is the other. I was, th this I was, rolls right into what I was going to ask Jay, and we'll get to the question. Well, I was going to say, too, that you guys need to also realize that uh, from a digital spend standpoint, brands are making a much deeper investment on video and photography assets right now. So from a clinic standpoint, we know that not every single one of our reps is going into every store and talking to every retail uh, employee. So definitely encourage you to find out what your brands have as far as resources go, whether it's a Dropbox library like we use of lifestyle studio imagery as well as videography for all of our products I mean that is an extension that you guys could be using digitally on your YouTube sites videos. that we do yeah. for you it's a free you know it's like a, a, a free give um, that we definitely need to collaborate on because if that gets out there as well it helps helps to educate your staff as well as your consumers so that's that's the thing the path to purchase with the path to education and of course you know dare I say YouTube because people that's how that's just how they learn that's how we all understand a lot of things. Is it perfect? Is it the best way? Could it be supplemented with clinics and knowledge? All those things, but good. And then we had a question. Or go ahead, Mark. I think, Scott, you also have to realize that um, you and I are not digital natives and that, that, they, that most of our staff do learn through YouTube videos and that that's that, that was my point. I think that's the reality. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so we can sit there and say we want to clinic. So the reality is the kid, the person sitting there looking on YouTube like I am when I have to fix anything. Uh, right? So why not embrace that and figure out how that can actually, you can, you can feed off that and make sure that's part of it. Well, and the other thing we is agree. Ask, ask your staff how they want to learn. Yeah. Um, when we get new employees, one of the questions is, are you a kinesthetic learner? Are you an auditory learner? Are you a visual learner? And we try to cater to those, those um, proclivities because someone's going to learn faster if you teach to them in the way that they want to learn. 
And I'll add one more thing on that as it relates to a website and the value of investing in a, a web platform. That's a learning tool. We have every, anyone who does it has people that put a lot of time into putting product pages up with really detailed specifications and descriptions of products. So when I talked about the touchscreen TV in our store, we didn't think about this at first. We learned it by watching our staff, but they ended up going to that screen with new staff and literally using it as a teaching tool. So it was a, has all sorts of different uses if you can incorporate the digital uh, into the mix. Oh, you get this question? Or you, oh, you have one. You have yeah, one. So I, can, I, just, we'll get to... I just wanted to ask: Do you pay for staff training? Because, like, for hourly employees, we pay. We pay when they're at, if they're in the store for a clinic, they're on the clock, and we pay them. Yeah. In our case. Yeah, we do. We have to schedule them. Sunday nights is often when we do it, and, and when we pay them. And that's an issue for a lot of people. I don't know how you handle that, Mark. We do the same thing, but when we have an on-snow demo day, um, we actually have our, our staff. They can either use a paid time off day for that day, but they also do get, um, they get that raise once they complete it. But in order to do that, they've got to answer several questions. It's like a 3.5 survey of our own. If you're going to go out and spend a day trying out skis at Sugarbush, when you come back, you need to be able to give us a review on 10 different skis that you tried on. And once you do that, yes, you get the raise, and yes, you did that on your own time, but we're making it available. They want to learn. We are, we are as human beings, we just are sponges for knowledge. We just need to make that knowledge available. All right, question here, and then we're going to go back there. Um, what strategies, tools, slash budget uh, do you guys use between... Um, some of you guys have the Amazon storefront versus your store website. Um, what process thinking goes through, um, like linking maybe your storefront, to your personal storefront to your Amazon storefront? Because on Amazon you have the ads, you have the videos, you have the images, you control all of that. So is it worth having both where you can just have like a landing page for your store and link it to where majority of consumers are going, which is Amazon? Without a doubt. Yep. You do both. We do both. We've got people coming from one or the other. I've, I've spoken to some friends who, um, who will go on to Amazon, shop for something, and then once they've figured out who's selling it, they'll go to that website and buy it because they know that we're not paying the commission to Amazon on that sale. Um, but I think that's the minority of our customers. Uh, most people just want to go to the platform they like, find what they want, and buy it. And that's that frictionless experience. So, you know, going back to that question, the fact that wherever they go online, whether they search through Google or they search through Amazon, they're going to get to us. That's what we want. But to your other question, we do limit the products that go on Amazon, not just through the vendors that don't allow us to put them on Amazon, but also on price. Because there is a point at which the cost of an item, it's not worth selling it through the Amazon platform. Uh, so we just don't send those into our feed to Amazon. And that's the paradigm shift, too. The consumer wants to buy it where they want to buy it. You've got to be everywhere that they want to buy it. Uh, there you go, Scott. Go for yeah, it. we have another question out here. So it's, it's good to hear some strategies that you have to deal with the comparison shopper who's got their phone in their hand or looked up a price online. It'd be good to hear a little bit more about those strategies and how you deal with those consumers to capture them, but also interested to hear about your attitude towards the brands that may have map violations going on causing that behavior. It's a challenge. And um, going back to the question of who's easy to, to do business with and who isn't, um, we're going to put more of our open to buy towards brands that maintain price in a way that we can work with. So if, if, if we've got a brand that isn't keeping price um, where we need it to be, we don't, we don't want to take those chances. We want to work with someone who uh, is holding price better. And you know, MAP is inherently good, I think, for the industry. But it's only good if everybody adheres to it. If there's a small group of bad operators who are not adhering to MAP, they're also probably outside of the realm of giving a crap. And so the vendors aren't going to be able to rein them in. And we just need to accept that's the reality. Uh, if we offer better service, better customer service, better phone service, better chat, all of these ways to engage with the consumer, we can maintain price. We can make money. We can all grow our retail business on both the digital and analog in-store platforms. Cool. In addition to price, I, we're at the point, and really this is probably the first season where it's front of mind for me and coming up in any discussion with vendors, but we're beginning to make our in-store product assortment decisions somewhat based on what brands are doing on Amazon. And so 
uh, for brands that might have a selective group on, that they allow out there, we want to be one of them, or we have to make decisions to shift and and put our business elsewhere. There's a couple brands I think that are uh, speaking very well to the specialty industry right now, yeah. and they're they're trying to protect it, whether they don't allow any selling on Amazon, um, or or things like that. And so we're I think we're just going to keep doing more of that though, yeah. and we're going to be forced um, out of a protect you know protection sure. to to shift to brands that have more favorable. Some of the brands, even premium brands. Uh, that sell right to Amazon. I understand it yeah. from a top line perspective, but I also think those are the decisions that are contributing to a lot of what smaller specialty guys are feeling. Yeah. 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 Jay, do you want to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from a brand perspective, I, I see I with the retailer and the brand, and this is a struggle, people. This is a very, very complex, fast moving, real time issue that everybody is burdened with and, and there's not a lot of silver bullets the most the great silver bullet is, is too extreme to be honest in my perspective where you either have to pick one or the other and that's not usually the best long-term sustainable solution so I encourage Rick and I we always talk about this I think the industry and as as partners we need to talk more about how do we work together to figure out the right solutions so that we can have you know, everybody wins a little bit. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Any other questions? Yeah, any other questions? Just one over back. Yeah, I'll go. In the back. Run, fast. Real quick, on to Amazon. So you guys have your brands that you sell on Amazon. What's your opinion as far as when Amazon cuts you guys out as a middleman and goes direct? So my example of that would be Nike. So Nike is now selling direct with Amazon. In return, Amazon is giving Nike basically most of their third party sellers information so they can cut that, keep price, but all those third party people are now cut out. So are we cannibalizing specialty by selling on Amazon? For us, I think we're almost looking at brands in tiers and it's based on what you're selling and who are your top brands. And I keep using the bank phrase from the market crash, but some brands are <laughs> too big to fail. So even if they're adopting a strategy like that, like a Nike, if you're a sports store, how are you not going to carry Nike? So that's it's really tough in that situation. Uh, and and I think it's a leverage game. So then when you maybe look at your your B tier brands, that's where we're starting to go in and get a little more aggressive with with what we're going to require because there's a lot of great brands out here, and so we're. You, we can do that with certain brands, but certain brands you can't right now, and so it is tough. I, I think with um, with all brands, the, the number of conversations I've had with uh, brand managers, with sales managers, with marketing managers about Amazon um, is easily at this point going into the weeks and months, and it's important to have them over and over and over again because ultimately. Outdoor specialty brick and mortar stores are the core and the heart of this industry. And the people who are running those businesses have the ear of the brands. And you, you got to be open to the fact that their needs are important. Not everyone can just drop Amazon 1P sales and, and have it not impact their bottom line significantly. But to start talking about scaling back those 1P sales and moving them into 3P, that puts the power back into outdoor specialty. And you can say to a brand, yeah, we know you need to be on Amazon. This is a critical marketplace. Half of the searches start on Amazon. But how do you be on Amazon and support your retailer well, you let those retailers sell on that platform and slowly try to, weed, uh, to wean yourself away from that 1P. And you keep having that conversation every six months, every three months, every month, as often as you have to, until people hear it and understand that it's important. Yeah, no, that's great. We'll hang around but, for a few more uh, minutes. Yeah, any, other, any other questions afterwards? We're going to put a landing page on both the cairnco.com where we'll have all the tactics listed, all our email addresses if you want to get in touch with us and ask us more questions. They'll also be on the outdoorbizpodcast.com. Biz Go to those two landing pages, learn more about it, engage us if you want to find out more about it, hang around if you want to ask us questions afterwards. Thanks to you guys for... Huge thank you. thank you. Thanks to you guys thank for coming. Thank you very much.